Hello, uh, this week's speaker for our Myths and Politics series is, was Calypso Nicladis, who uh, is a professor of international relations at the University of Oxford uh, and a fellow at the St. Anthony's College of European, at the European Studies Centre. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to speak in a seminar series. Could you tell us a little bit about what your paper was about? Um, well, I was very um, honored and happy to present to a group of peers who are not from my own disciplines, mostly, although it's an interdisciplinary seminar, but it's in the, the world of classicist. And I come at it from political science, political philosophy, international relations, where I've traditionally asked questions about transnational democracy. And um, I explained in the seminar that um, when Brexit happened, uh, somehow it connected with my own kind of Greek DNA and my upbringing in Greek mythology as a, as a person rather than as a scholar. And I started to understand Brexit through the filter of Greek mythology and as well as biblical myth. And in a way, mythical patterns, as we discussed in the seminar, actually, that they might be universal, although one wants to be careful not to be too Eurocentric. Anyway, so I explained this story and how um, many myths can be used as metaphor starting point, but subverted because they don't constitute some age old wisdom. Um, there are ways of reframing the topic, finding a common vocabulary for a conversation in a very polarized world where maybe we need some ways of bed, such ways of communicating which, which are not you know, from one side or the other, stay or remain or leave or, or right or left or whatever. And, um, and so in, in the book, the book is called uh, Exodus, Reckoning, Sacrifice and Three Meanings of Brexit. It's about the deeper meanings um, of the of the um, of, of the for politics, but from that book, so I presented the big the big ideas of the book. But from that book, I also extracted a number of themes which are broader than the Brexit theme. Um, the question, for instance, of um, scapegoating and sacrifice and that's very important of course in the age of, of coronavirus pandemic where already today but probably more tomorrow we will see a, a cert, a, an attempt to blame certain people uh, groups or individuals and that's very dangerous while we also need to really look for cause and effect in a scientific way but how is the, are these two things different and we learn from the ancient world, from the story of Oedipus and Theseus, what, what is a scapegoat? Why societies do need scapegoat and what kind of scapegoat they find. People who are kind of like them, but kind of different and who somehow can be done away with. Um, and I think it's very important for our societies to deconstruct this age old pattern of scapegoating. And what's interesting is that the ancient Greeks were both um, in it and yet they were also very um, conscious of it and tried themselves to um, to deconstruct scapegoating. That's just one example. Another one is my permanent obsession with praising ambivalence. I, be, I believe that one way to create a politics, to recreate a politics which is less polarized and more tolerant is to uh, allow people to tap into their own personal ambivalence because in a way we're all ambivalent. Freud said it before us and um, to appeal to people's kind of yearning perhaps for tapping into this I use Ulysses who himself was ambivalent about whether he should go to war or stay home with his family and people don't know this usually about Ulysses so it's important to tell them the story to kind of shift the, the gaze as it were. Um, I also discuss um, hubris, political hubris, and ask, and we had a wonderful discussion, including with Maria, uh, about whether there is not only bad hubris, which make you do things that are um, beyond, uh, that are, that destroy what is around you, but maybe there's good hubris because you can become radical and question the status quo. And Prometheus, which we discussed in the seminar, was the ultimate 
hero who suffered, who was punished for his hubris, but we, we actually very much take his side. After all, he rebelled against the, the gods and, um, and, and offered the fire to, um, to, um, to humankind. Of course, the problem is we did strange things with these fires and put the planet on fire ultimately. So maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So this is examples of how we um, can use Greek mythology and there are many, many others, but in a way that taps into the kind of memory that people may have, they remember their old myth, but also what they might surprise them, might unsettle. And that's how you can have a better democratic conversation if you unsettle people's belief. And these stories are a way to enter with a bit of irony, or more modern irony, uh, to, to enter a space where we can have these conversations. Thanks so much. I mean, it's been absolutely fascinating. I mean, your talk was certainly the most topical we've had so far. And I think it's really important to see how myths are used in politics. I mean, how does this fit into your wider research? And particularly, how do your politics colleagues react to your mythical turn? Ah, that's such a beautiful question, Maria. I wish I kind of knew because I, I, I can imagine that quite a number of them kind of say, hmm, you know, well, she used to be working on balance of power and war and peace and international trade, you know, what's going on with Calypso? So, you know, but they wouldn't quite tell me in this way. Uh, so, I, yes, I would say that um, I am lucky that I'm not a young person anymore. I don't have to worry about whatever, whoever, you know, Things. I think that many of my colleagues do find this really interesting. It does speak to them. They understand what I'm trying to do. And also that, you know, at, at a certain stage in your career, it does matter to, to go beyond the realm of the scholarship that you and, and your co close colleagues and to reach out to a broader audience and find languages that connect our disciplines with a broader public. And I think, of course, in a way, I'm, I'm stealing from you guys, Maria, you know, from classics. <laughs> I'm like using you, <laughs> using as a, as a kind of resource, um, all these amazing stories to say things that I could say in a dry theoretical way. You know, there are theories about all of this and I'm just trying to make them more vivid and real and accessible. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for once more for agreeing to, to speak in this area. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you. And it was a really interesting take on the ancient myths. Uh, really cool to have them put into the context of the modern world. So again, thank you very much.